Good morning once again. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 1. If anyone is new here this morning, we just want to let you know that we have started a study through the Gospel of John here at Calvary on Sunday mornings. We are currently in a section in chapter 1 where Jesus is now beginning to invite or to call men to follow him by becoming his disciples. And we have uh, called this section, which runs from verses 35 to 51, The Invitation of Jesus, a section I've subtitled, The Requirements of Discipleship. And we'll see how that works as we go on. But let's back up to verse 35 and pick it up where it says, Again the next day John stood with two of his disciples. Now this is John the Baptist. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which which is to say when translated teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. It was now about the 10th hour, probably about 10 a.m. As we said last time, guys, in those days, a disciple, and the Greek word is mathetes, which means a learner, a learner, was a person who lived with their rabbi so they could learn and absorb everything they could from this person's life. When John and Andrew asked Jesus where he was staying, it was their way of saying, we might want to be your disciples. (laughs) Can we come home with you and hang out for a while? Got to check out. But we decided to commit ourselves. Of course, guys, the ultimate goal of becoming the disciple of a teacher in Jewish culture, they were called rabbis, was to so study his life that, listen, this is the ultimate goal now, that his heart would ultimately be reproduced within the disciple. We know that later on, Jesus told his disciples the whole purpose for which he had come to the earth. He said, I have come to seek and to save those that are lost. The whole purpose for Jesus coming to the earth, the whole reason he died and rose again was so that people could be saved. Now, Jesus started the work of saving the lost. And let me just say this, saving the lost on a worldwide scale. I'm not saying nobody ever got saved before Jesus. That's not true. They did. But it was basically limited to the Jewish people. There were some Gentile converts to Judaism called proselytes and all. But now Jesus came to do something new. He came to make the gospel available to every person on the face of the earth. So he began that work in his uh, his earthly ministry. And now, before he ascended back to his father... He gave that work over to his church to continue that work on the earth, which it's called the Great Commission, where Jesus said to them, go into into us, of course, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. Now, guys, when we talk about being disciples of Jesus, and again, being disciples, we want his heart reproduced in us. That's the whole point, right? We must understand that first and foremost, listen, his heart is all about reaching people with the gospel. I think that the modern church in America has gotten confused about its purpose in the world. If you were to ask the average churchgoer, I'm not saying they're all saved, but I'm just saying the average churchgoer, what they believe the purpose of the church is, many would answer to give people a sense of community. Give people a sense of community. Others would no doubt say, well, to provide necessary services like, you know, baptisms, marriage ceremonies, funerals, etc., Still others would see the purpose of the church as that of a social agency, that's big today, you know, to help the needy and feed the hungry, or to work to bring about social justice, or even, and this is actually the mission statement of some churches today, and it's growing in number, to help save the planet from global warming. Now look, some of that is legitimate, I mean, come on, Uh, helping the poor, feeding the hungry, giving people a sense of community, hey, that's nothing wrong with that. But those are not the main goal. They are not the main focus or purpose of the church. Jesus said clearly that the reason he came to the earth was to seek and save the lost. 
And if that was and is his heart, it must be our heart as well. And, of course, the main purpose for his church's existence. But this guy begs the question, why aren't we doing a better job at saving the lost than we are? I'm speaking now in general terms throughout the whole body of Christ. Why aren't we doing a better job at saving the lost than we are? If that was Jesus' heart, if that was the focus of his ministry, what's going on today? Well, there's various reasons for this. I think one of the main ones is that in general, now I'm talking about the church in general, we've stopped focusing on saving the lost as our primary mission as Christians, and we've shifted the focus of the church to serving ourselves. Let me read to you a little story I I picked up years ago. I've read it before, so if you've heard it, bear with me. It's called A Life-Saving Station, and it goes along with what we're talking about. Here here it is, and I quote, On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. With no thought for themselves, they went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. New boats were bought and new crews were trained. The little life-saving station grew. Some of the members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they use it now as sort of a club also. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decoration, and there was a liturgical lifeboat in the room where club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and some of them had black skin, and some of them had yellow skin. Well, the beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwrecks could could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club's membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of all those various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And so they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself, and if you were to visit that seacoast today, you would find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown, end quote. Now, of course, the person who wrote that little story wrote it as an allegory of the church and how that the church started out with a very simple mission, to seek and to save those that were lost. That was our mission because our leader, Jesus Christ, stated in Luke 19.10 that that was his mission on the earth, and then commissioned us to go and do the same. This meant, guys, that he had called his church to be a life-saving station. As the church was founded in the book of Acts, it consisted of mostly poor but but extremely dedicated people who were determined to carry out their mission no matter what the cost. But sadly, over time, so many churches have lost sight of that mission. As God has blessed them and they have prospered, they have built large, beautiful buildings with elegant furniture and decor. Often they contain food courts and coffee shops and so many amenities that Christians can stay at church for hours on end fellowshipping, and enjoying each other's company. You say, well, is that wrong? 
Well, not necessarily, but it can definitely be a distraction, and it has led to certain consequences. The tragic result is that more and more Christians see their Christianity as merely a social outlet, a form of entertainment, and not as part of a spiritual rescue team going out into a shipwrecked world seeking and saving those who are lost. Because of this, more and more Christians are looking to others to do the work of rescuing the lost while they remain in a place of comfort and complacency. The result is that more and more people are dying and going to hell as the church of Jesus Christ in these latter days, for the most part, stands by seemingly unconcerned. Now look, I'm not saying that Christians don't want to see people saved. It's just that many apparently don't care enough to roll up their sleeves and make the sacrifices necessary to actually do the work. You know, as I've studied the history of the church in America, it was amazing how the Spirit moved in the 18th and 19th centuries, and missionaries were sent all over the known world as the church was consumed with the desire to see people saved. And I believe that these that these movements that where people were going out and onto the mission field, starting missions, uh, even in America, you had evangelism was the main focus. I believe that these revolved around the great awakenings of the 18th century and the great revivals of the 19th century. Folks, we need revival and great awakenings today. People have gotten so dull of hearing. I'm talking about the loss now. They're not very open to the gospel. We need a move of the Spirit. But look, we can all share in the work, though. While we're praying for the Spirit to move, we have stuff that we need to be doing. Look, not everyone is called to be an evangelist full-time or a missionary full-time. But we're all called to serve, aren't we? We're all called to serve. And the idea is that we can pray, we can give, to the work of God, supporting the missionaries and uh, the evangelists and so on. And then be involved in one of the many ministries in our church. You know, Paul the Apostle said in Ephesians chapter 4, when the whole body, and what he's talking about is every member of the local church, when the whole body uses their gifts and works together, listen, everyone doing their share, as Paul put it, well, he said the church is able to function as God designed it, And the work of God gets done. And that work is to save the lost and to sanctify or to edify or to build up the saints. That's our whole purpose. And yet, the general attitude in the church today seems to be, let someone else do the work while they continue, quote-unquote, socializing for Jesus. As if that's a ministry. Okay? Uh, You know, drinking coffee, eating donuts, and socializing for Jesus. What do you do in the church? That's what I do. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. And because of this, guys, and don't miss this, because of this, many Christians now look at the church as a business, offering products and services that will enrich their lives. In other words, church is all about making them satisfied, happy, and fulfilled. You know, Chuck Colson in his book, The Body, says that the church is going through an identity crisis. That we have forgotten what we are and what purpose is, what is our purpose? He said, and I quote, the roots of the church's identity crisis are found in the consumer mentality so pervasive in our culture. Ask people what they look for in a church, and the number one response is fellowship. Other answers range from good, uh, from good sermons to the music program to youth activities for the kids to it makes me feel good. People flit around, he said, about, uh, people flit about in search of what suits their tastes at the moment. It's what some have called the McChurch mentality. Today it might be McDonald's for a Big Mac, tomorrow it's Wendy's salad bar, or perhaps the wonderful chicken sandwiches at Chick fil A. Thus the church becomes just another retail outlet, faith just another commodity. People change congregations and preachers and even denominations as readily as they change banks or grocery stores. What many are looking for is a spiritual social club, an institution that offers convivial relationships but certainly does not influence how people live or what they believe. 
He says spiritual consumers are interested not in what a church stands for, but in the fulfillment it can deliver to them, end quote. Look, as long as Christians see their personal happiness as the chief goal of life and the church as a place to help satisfy that goal, as long as Christians choose a church the same way they choose a vacation destination based on all the amenities and opportunities for fun and social interaction and entertainment, as long as their Christian life is more self-centered than Christ-centered, well, they will continue to miss the real purpose for Jesus saving them. And guys, without any real eternal purpose, and that's the whole point. You can join any, any number of organizations that will help you have some kind of purpose in this world on a practical level. There, in fact, there are many good uh, organizations that help people, like the Red Cross or Our Family Donates to St. Jude's and the Shriners Children's Hospital because I want to see children helped and so on. There's a lot of good organizations that you can be a part of that will give you a purpose in this life that will help people. Only the Church of Jesus Christ offers an eternal purpose. And that, guys, is the most important purpose in life. Because whatever we are involved in in this life, when we die, it's over for us. And, of course, those organizations are going to eventually go by the wayside. But what you do for Jesus Christ is going to last for eternity and impact people for eternity. Without any real sense of purpose, though, eternal purpose for living their Christian life, these folks will eventually begin to drift away from God because, listen, this is the mentality. They're not getting anything out of church and Christianity. Listen to that. I've been reading numerous articles, especially uh, about millennials, the young generation. So many of these kids are not going to church. You ask them why? Because I don't get anything out of church. Here's what they're saying. I go to church to get stuff for me. I go to church to be served. This is exactly opposite what the Lord Jesus said his purpose was for his disciples. He said, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. And the idea is when people come to church with the attitude, I have come to be served, not to serve, well, right out, right out of the gate, their Christianity, so-called, is doomed to fail. I was talking with a pastor just the other day. He was telling me how they can't get young moms to work in the nursery. They got kids in the nursery. Usually the women working in the nursery said are the older saints. I mean, they've raised their kids. And when we've approached some of these young gals to ask if they would help out, their kids are using the nursery, if they would help out in the church taking a, a one, one a Sunday a month, they don't want to have any part of it because they didn't come to serve. They have come to be served. This is the mentality today. Now look, guys, I think the basic underlying problem that has led to so many people leaving churches and going back to the world or getting involved in New Age mysticism or into even into witchcraft or the occult. And again, uh, I just read an article a few days ago where millennials, and they're not the only ones, but this is the, uh, the highest percentage group, that millennials are flocking to things like Wiccan, witchcraft, uh, or uh, Eastern mysticism. Because it seems to give them something they're looking for, power, a feeling of uh, confidence, Uh, and so on. So they try the church for a while, and we're all about the cross, right? If you're a good evangelical church, we're all about the cross. But they don't want that. They want to come and uh, be, you know, made to feel good about themselves. They want their fragile little ego ego stroked constantly. Um, They're coming to Jesus for the wrong reasons in the first place, all right? That's the idea. Uh, we, we look at people who are, again, not staying in churches, trying them out and leaving. A lot of them are, are doing that because they're coming to Jesus for the wrong reasons in the first place. Let's look at this for a moment by looking at our passage a little more closely. When John the Baptist introduced his two disciples, John and Andrew, to Jesus by calling Jesus the Lamb of God, he was basically saying, here's the Messiah. Here's the Messiah. We read in verse 37 that John and Andrew started to follow Jesus. Now when Jesus turned and saw that they were following him, he said to them, What do you seek? See that there? Now we could interpret that in a very superficial way. 
where Jesus said to them, hey guys, what are you looking for? What's going on? What do you, what do you want? You know, just very superficial. Or we could interpret that, and I think this is the correct interpretation, a little deeper. Where Jesus sees them kind of following at a distance and turns to them and says, what do you seek? Guys, I believe every pastor, evangelist, and Christian who comes across someone who is thinking about following Jesus, well, we need to ask them, really, as Jesus asked John and Andrew, you know, what is it you're looking for? What, what is it you're seeking? In other words, why do you want to follow him? What are you looking for? What do you hope to get from following Jesus? And I say that because, truth be told, many would no doubt say that they were looking to follow Jesus because they were looking for happiness or for fulfillment um, or for Jesus to save their marriage or deliver them from alcohol uh, or drugs. In fact, many pastors and evangelists today are encouraging people to follow Jesus for very practical, material uh, kind of reasons, promising them that if they follow Jesus, he'll heal all their diseases, he will um, bless their finances, prosper their businesses. It's all about blessings on earth that many pastors and evangelists are encouraging people as, as reasons to follow Jesus. Guys, look, I'm not trying to minimize the emotional hurts or the physical needs that people have that make them so desperate when they can't, can't find help anywhere else, that make them so desperate they finally come to Jesus for help. I'm not putting that down. And often the Lord will meet those needs and help those people with whatever it is they're going through because, listen, he loves them. And as Paul the Apostle said in Romans 2, verse 4, the goodness of the Lord will often bring a person to repentance and salvation. We see this in the Gospels, don't we? With the woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, spent all of her money, this is recorded in Matthew 9, spent all of her money on doctors, nobody could help her. She comes to Jesus in total desperation looking for a healing, and Jesus heals her. Or the father with the demon-possessed son is recorded in Mark 9. How this father had this son and was demon-possessed. Nobody could help this kid. And often the, the evil spirits inside this kid threw him into the fire and threw him into water to kill him. He was so desperate, he finally comes to Jesus and said, Lord, if you, can, if you can do anything, please help us. And Jesus delivered his son from the demon. In fact, you only have to read this, the gospel superficially to see that a vast majority of people that came to Jesus came for practical reasons that he might heal them of their sicknesses or their demonic possession or blindness, paralysis, some other physical malady. Guys, look, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what brings a person to Jesus for help. But if they decide they want to follow him permanently, in other words, become one of his disciples, in other words, become Christians, he would ask them why. Why? What are they ultimately seeking from him? Is it that he might be their servant and continue to bless them and be at their beck and call looking at Jesus as kind of like a divine butler, as we talked about a couple weeks, a few weeks ago? And prayer then becomes the little bell that they ring, you know, so that, uh, you know, summonsing servant Jesus, so he can, you know, uh, come and bring them another pillow to make their lives ever more comfortable. You know, as we read in the Gospels, or we, as we read the Gospels, it becomes clear that many of Jesus' own disciples followed him because they wanted positions of prestige and power in his administration when he finally established his kingdom. In fact, they had a running argument among themselves throughout Jesus' earthly ministry as to who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Remember that? James and John even sent their mother to ask him if her boys could sit one in his right hand, the other on his left, in his kingdom. Guys, this is nothing more than selfish ambition. People using Jesus for their own selfish purposes. I think we would all probably do know somebody, but there's many who follow Jesus, not because they love him and want to serve him, but because they really love themselves, let's be honest. And look at Jesus as a means to an end. What is that end? That he would bless them, prosper them, meet their every need, much of their desires, that Jesus would just be this divine person in heaven that will pour out upon them constant blessings that's why he's there he's there to bless me they think and look 
It's not wrong to ask Jesus to meet your needs, heal your body, or bless you and your family. The Bible encourages us to bring our prayers to God for those things. The problem comes when people only follow Jesus for what they can get from him. Now, I don't know what was in the hearts of John and Andrew that day when they started to follow Jesus and he turned to them and said and asked them, what do you seek? Somebody got a phone you need to answer? Pastor Mike, you need to, need to uh, confiscate the phones. I don't know what was in John and Andrew's heart that day when they came to Jesus and started to follow him. And he turned and asked them, what do you seek? Guys, I do know that most people in this world have no idea what they're seeking in life. Even some who are following Jesus, which is sad to say. One author put it this way, said, and I quote, What are you looking for in life? What are you pursuing? Many people aren't even sure themselves. For many, life is all about making money, buying things they need, and many other things they don't need but want. With some of that money, they take uh, nice vacations. But if you were to ask them what ultimate goal uh, they are seeking besides all the mundane and superficial things in life that they seek after, if you were to ask them what in life were they ultimately seeking, they wouldn't be able to answer that because they haven't asked themselves that question, end quote. We get so locked into our daily routine, and the devil is very good at this, making us constantly busy, that often we don't take the time as people now, speaking of people in general, Often people don't take the time to ask themselves the most important questions in, in life, such as, why am I here? All right, uh, What is my purpose for living? And most importantly, what's going to happen to me when I die? If Satan can make you so busy, a person never really grapples with those eternal issues. He can get them so busy they'll die in their sins, and then they've lost, e they've lost for eternity. That's why every time I do a funeral, I always quote from Ecclesiastes 7.2. Let me quote it for you. It's better to go into the house of mourning than to go into the house of feasting. Because this is the end of every man, and the living will take it to heart. Paraphrase, better to go to a funeral than a party. Because at a party, you're just living in the moment. At a funeral, you're brought face to face with your own mortality. We're all going to die. We're all going to die someday, and you know what? At a funeral, we're, we are reminded of that. So what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, if we're not believers, you know, what is life all about? This is the end of every man. The living will take it to heart. Everyone's going to die. Hopefully you take it to heart before you die, because then you can do something about it. You can receive Christ. So this is a question that many people don't wrestle with, you know. But it's a question that Jesus is constantly asking people in various ways, various ways, especially those who are contemplating following him. Verse 38, John 1. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, Teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about 10 in the morning. Once again, guys, when Jesus asked John and Andrew, who started, listen, don't miss this, who started to casually follow him without making a formal commitment to him, after the Lord asked them what they were seeking, they said, where are you staying? Again, that was their way of saying, we think we want to commit to you and officially become your disciples, but we're not sure yet. Can we follow you home and talk to you about it? So they asked, where are you staying? He responded, come and see. You know, the Lord Jesus never discourages honest seekers, does he? He never discourages honest seekers and will always invite them to come to where he is if they want to know more about him in the hopes that, you know, they will decide to make a commitment to him and become full-time disciples, born-again Christians. Today, guys, the place where Jesus dwells primarily would be the local church. Now, there's a caveat here, okay? Because in the day in which we're living, so many churches have been corrupted that Jesus, like the church of Laodicea in, in Revelation 3, he's knocking to get in. He's not even in the church. He's knocking to have them let him in. A lot of liberal churches, a lot of churches today that are not 
good solid churches well what constitutes a good solid church where jesus is if it's a church that faithfully teaches his word if it's a church that faithfully teaches his word jesus is there he's there and if you want to be used by god to win the loss to him well invite them to church so they can see for themselves the difference that jesus has made in the lives of all of his people look people can argue with your doctrine but they can argue with a changed life i mean you know that is a testimony that speaks very powerfully you know people want to argue about doctrine theology i don't argue with that anymore but you know what if a person if you're trying to reach somebody for christ and you are living the christian life you are letting your light shine they can argue your doctrine with you they can argue doctrine with you but they can't argue a changed life that's a powerful witness all right so bring them to church and let them get to know some folks and as people share their testimonies about how they were drug addicts, alcoholics. They were involved in one sin after another. When they came to Christ, he delivered them from those things. That's a powerful witness, right? And the first place, if you're worried about saving the lost, and if you're not, can I ask you to pray about that? Can I ask you to pray? This is not to condemn anybody, just to challenge you as we come into a new year. It's easy for our hearts to get cold. We get so preoccupied on, you know, the things of this life and paying bills and so on. Maybe you lost a job and you're looking for a new job. At that moment, you're so consumed with your situation, you don't really are not thinking of the lost. Ask God to work in your heart a renewed passion to see people saved. And as he begins to do that, the first place to start is with your own family. I love verses 40 to 42. Verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon. He first found, that was the first person he witnessed to. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated to Christ. And verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. I believe soul winning should start with your family and close friends. And it could be as simple as inviting them to church. You know what? When Calvary Chapel first started back in the 60s, my goodness, as God began to move in the hearts of these young kids especially, wow, they didn't know anything. They just knew they loved Jesus. They knew that Jesus had changed them. And so they began to invite their families and their friends. They'd bring their, with their Volkswagen uh, vans. They'd bring van loads of kids to church. Just bringing them to church. And as these kids walked in, my mother's own testimony, she got saved before any of us and helped lead us to the Lord, her family, her kids. When she first walked into Calvary Chapel on a Thursday night, because that's when they had their midweek service. They, they had just moved out there, were busy unpacking boxes. By the time she was able to check the church, I was a Thursday night, she walks in, it was so packed. There were, there were people, mostly young people, all up and down the, the, the aisles and things. And as she walked in, she heard these beautiful choruses being sung to God, and these kids had their hands raised. It sent shivers down her spine. She was impacted. Nothing had been said yet other than just seeing God's people praising him. And as soon as Pastor Chuck came out and just simply opened the word and began to teach, her life was never the same. You don't have to be a theologian to bring somebody to Jesus. Bring them to church. Bring them to church. And listen, the Lord doesn't mind a person checking him out. James, Andrew, excuse me, John and Andrew wanted to kind of check the Lord out first. That's okay. So that's pretty carnal. No, not really. The Lord doesn't mind us a person checking him out before they make a commitment to him. In fact, he actually encouraged that when he challenged potential disciples to first what? Count the cost? before making a commitment to him. But guys, make no mistake about it, and we'll end with this. Make no mistake about it. Jesus isn't looking, listen, he's not looking for a perpetual, casual, dating relationship with you. He wants, and he's looking for a commitment. That's why it's called a marriage proposal in the scriptures. Jesus Christ wants a bride. He wants to marry Folks that become part of his church. That's the kind of commitment he's looking for. Some people, 
in the church are simply satisfied to date Jesus. Okay. But they're not interested in taking their relationship deeper by making a commitment to him, you know, a commitment to love him, serve him, stay with him in sickness, health, good times, hard times, for the rest of their lives, and of course on into eternity. But this is the kind of commitment that Jesus is looking for from those who are thinking about following him. And yet some people aren't interested in entering into that level of commitment with the Lord. Just like some guys, some men will want to keep dating a woman, but don't want to commit themselves to her in marriage. Some of you girls may have uh, dated a guy like that. You really began to have feelings for this guy. You wanted to to eventually marry him, but he wasn't interested. He just wanted to date you. That's all about a man getting from you what he needs, but not wanting to give to you what God wants, which is making a proposing marriage to you and making a commitment to you. So a lot of people that come to church looking to get things from Jesus, but not looking to give the kind of commitment to him that he's looking for, uh, where he wants to be, he's committed himself to us already. Okay, at the cross, he already made his intentions clear. I love you. I have died for you. I want to be in a relationship, a marriage covenant, for all eternity with you. That's the invitation. Now, it's up to individuals to say, yes, Lord, I love you too, and I want to be married to you. I want to right now make a commitment to you and to live the rest of my life to honor you and be faithful to you to you and so on commitment guys commitment jesus would later would uh, later lay out the cost and requirements of true discipleship in matthew's gospel chapter 16 i'll just read it to you we'll look at it in detail next time jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me Guys, in this one verse, Jesus teaches on the kind of commitment that it takes to be a true disciple of his. We're talking about Jesus inviting men and women to follow him. We're talking about Jesus inviting them to be disciples of him. What is involved? There are requirements. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. Because if the commitment isn't there, manifested in the fact that you are following him, we'll see it next week, well, you're fooling yourself. I don't want anyone to stand before the Lord someday and hear him say, I never knew you depart from me. Oh, but I went to church. Yeah, a lot of people went to church looking to get stuff from me. But not looking to commit their lives to me. This is what he's looking for. May God give us grace to uh, make that total commitment. So we'll pick it up the week after Christmas as we finish chapter 1. Father, we thank you. For your goodness and grace, Lord, we thank you that you loved us and proved it by dying for us. And Lord, you want us to enter into a commitment with you, a deep, abiding commitment, marriage. And Lord, after we have done that, please give us your heart for the lost that others might come, that we might see our church as a life-saving station, that we never become so complacent or so... Um, used to your blessings that we want to become an exclusive club. We don't want dirty sinners in here. We don't want people with uh, pink hair and body piercings and tattoos everywhere. No, Lord, these are the kind of people you died for. Give us grace to reach out to them by your love and grace that they might be saved. Lord, we ask you to keep blessing these studies for your glory. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.